thank you for joining us in this uh, edition of our monthly educational webinar where we uh, invite and speak with uh, different experts from a variety of industries all for the purpose of educating you our listeners on the benefits of um, self-directed IRA plans and the different investments one may take advantage of through this uh, vehicle. Today's presentation I'm really excited about. It's going to be an intriguing one. Um, SDIRA, self-directed IRA, investing in startups before the public. I'm excited to have with us Roy Mullen of Karmic Payback, a pre-IPO expert, on our webinar to talk to you about how new startups are raising capital and how this consistent demand for capital is presenting unique opportunities for self-directed IRA holders. But before I bring on Roy uh, to share uh, his insight and expertise with us, allow me please just a few minutes, two or three minutes, to talk to you about uh, the interest group, our role, et cetera. Uh, but before we do that, I have a disclaimer that we have to read out. Uh, the interest group does not provide any investment advice uh, nor endorse any products. All our information and materials are for educational purposes only. All parties are encouraged to consult with their attorneys, accountants, and financial advisors before entering any type of investment. Here's our agenda for today. Again, a quick uh, introduction from me, and then I bring in uh, Roy, talks to you about uh, pre-IPO investing and uh, the, the, the Einstein rule of 72, which is uh, very excited to hear about. The flow of pre-IPO capital raising life cycle, six sectors that are trending uh, per uh, market experts. And then we're gonna allow it for Q&A time where I'm sure you'll have some questions. Uh, please enter those in the question box there that you see. We'll get to those uh, time permitting after the uh, presentation. A little bit about myself. I'm the Regional Business Development Manager at the Entrust Group. Been there for the past 20 years. I've enjoyed working with investors and professionals alike educating them on the benefits of self-directed IRA plans. Um, I'm CISP certified, which is a certified um, IRA specialist professional. A little bit about the Entrust Group. Um, for over 40 years, we have empowered our over 45,000 investors to take charge of their retirement plans. We have over $4 billion in investor assets. And with our one point of contact, we provide our clients with superior customer service and faster transaction times, which is really pivotal in our industry. So we are one of the old, nation's oldest and largest self-directed IRA administrators. We provide our clients with the administration and record keeping of their IRA accounts, as well as we, uh, we offer the online portal with a 24 seven account uh, access. We pride ourselves with our client education resources that are available through our online library of articles, white papers, webinars, in-person events. We actually hold national and local events. If you're interested in learning more about this, please contact us and we'll direct you to the, the right person in your region. We actually also are very proud on um, sponsoring our um, IRA Academy twice a year, where we actually teach the course that trains other people in our industry to pass this um, elite CISP course, the Certified IRA uh, Services Professional. Real quick, um, what is a self-directed IRA? For those of you that are not familiar, it's really very simple. It's not a type of IRA, it's just a term used in the industry for an IRA that gives you increased control, greater diversification over your investments and retirement savings. You're in charge of making all of your investment decisions, allows you greater opportunities for asset diversification. So unlike IRAs that are typically held at brokerage firms or banks, an SDIRA is not limited to stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. With an SDIRA, you can invest in everything from private equity, precious metals, LLCs, limited partnerships, real estate, and startups, and much more. So speaking of startups, this is time to hand over the mic to uh, Roy, um, again, our pre-IPO expert here um, that's going to take it over from here. Welcome, Roy. The mic is yours. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank everyone it's taking some time out of their day today to learn something new. Hopefully you'll find some points of interest along the way. I'm even going to entertain you a little bit, uh, but I certainly want to start by thanking Intrust for making this webinar possible for hosting this event. I have worked with Munzer for quite some time and Andrew as well, and the rest of the staff at Intrust are just outstanding. We referred a lot of our investors there, and without exception, it has always been a great experience. So look forward to that. What we're going to be talking about today, I know that traditionally are most commonly Self-directed IRAs are used for real estate investments, and that's great, and that's good, and I'm a big believer in diversified portfolios. Uh, so we're going to show another way today that you might be able to diversify. It is for a portion of your risk capital. Please understand that. Uh, this is if you want to take a swing at the fences. This is not your bread and butter investment. This would be for uh, your hopes for larger returns. But I will explain a little bit about karmic payback and all that we do to try and de-risk any deal we put before you. I also want you to know that we have our own skin in the game. So we don't bring deals to you. We don't believe in ourselves. So disclaimer, disclaimer, I bet none of you have ever seen one of these before, but uh, the uh, past performance, no guarantee of future uh, success, et cetera, et cetera. If you have trouble sleeping, we can email you a copy of this because it will put you right to sleep. But uh, we'll get that out of the way and focus on more fun stuff. But uh, disclaimer, disclaimer on everything I say today. No guarantees. And my one of my business partners, Alan Sanders, uh, has been on a flight. I got a text from him that his plane has landed. It is unclear if or when he'll be able to join us. Uh, he is smarter than I am. The good news, I'm better looking and funnier. So I hope you'll consider that a plus today. But we'll see if he is able to join us at some point during this uh, presentation. If not, I got it covered. So just kind of the overall uh, presentation here, we're going to be covering uh, what is a private company? What is the path to a public offering? How do you get to participate in that? Uh, we're going to talk about the Rule of 72. That's one of my favorites from Einstein. And uh, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to cover some actual case studies, some companies that we've helped bring public and bring to NASDAQ. So I think we can move on to the next one then and how you're going to use your interest IRA to do that. So the Rule of 72, I find it fascinating how few people uh, don't know this one, uh, even financial professionals. I have taught this class to MBA students who do not know this one. And I didn't know it. I certainly didn't learn it in my public education. I learned it later. But the rule of 72 is a rule of thumb that Albert Einstein came up with. He said it was one of his favorites. Uh, and it's a way of calculating how long it's going to take your money to double at a given interest rate. So say, for example, that you had a dollar and you had a very generous bank that gave you 1% interest on your savings account. So at the end of the year, your dollar is now a dollar and a penny, right? You earn 1% interest. And the next year, that dollar and a penny earned another penny and a little bit more. Doing that, how long will it take your $1 to become $2? And since you're all muted and don't get really to answer that question, I'm just going to let you know the answer is on the board. It will take 72 years for that $1 to become $2 if you're earning a 1% interest rate. The point of that is to let you know that even as young as you are, I don't know how many 72s you have left to double your money. Therefore, you may want to try for some higher interest rates to make those doubles happen faster. And that's the cool thing about the rule of 72. Whatever interest rate you're getting, you can divide it into 72 and it will tell you how many years it's going to take it to double. Okay, this is round numbers, right? So let's assume for a moment that when you were age 20, or if I was age 20, and my great aunt Matilda gave me $10,000. Now, of course, if my great aunt Matilda had given me $10,000 when I was 20, I would have had a great party that weekend. The money would be gone, but I'm going to assume that you're smarter than I am. So you're going to take that money and put it in a nice, quiet bond fund, and we're going to earn 4% interest. Yay, that's better than 1%. So at age 20, I started with $10,000. You divide four into 72, that's 18. So now 18 years later, instead of 72 years later, your money has doubled. So now you've gone from 10,000 to 20,000. 18 years after that, you're now 56 and your 20,000 has doubled to 40,000. And I'm ready to retire uh, for about six weeks. I hope your retirement nest egg is going to be greater than $40,000. Otherwise your retirement plan will come with the expression, would you like fries with that? Because you're probably still going to be working. All right, so scroll through that. And we're just going to show you what 4% would do, which again is a lot better than taking 72 years to double it. 
but it's still not going to be a great retirement plan. So when I was first learning this stuff, I thought, man, if I could get 12%, because that's the average over historically for small cap funds, right? 70 year average, eh, roughly 12%. Man, if I could get 12%, that's three times the interest rate. I'm going to have three times as much money. Mm, actually, it's much more powerful than that. You get more doubles. So now you're going to divide 12 into 72, that's six. Now my money's going to double every six years. Start off at age 20, same $10,000. And we're going to double it at age six and uh, so at 26 it doubles at 32 it doubles again etc and i'm going to let him roll that out by the time you get to that same age 56 it's not forty thousand dollars it's six hundred and forty thousand dollars so your first iq test of the day which one do you like better don't answer in case you get it wrong obviously we'd all rather have six hundred and forty thousand dollars in retirement than forty thousand right just a sidebar for those of you who have uh, young people in your life. What happens at age 20? They go, oh, retirement's a million years from now. I got plenty of time to do that. At age 20, man, I've got some student loans and I'm still working my way through college. I can wait like 26. That's plenty of time. They wait until age 26. You just lost that bottom double. That 640 is gone. Now the best you can hope for is 320. And at age 26, they go, oh, man, retirement's still a million years away. I, got a, I just got this new job. I need a new car and some new clothes to go with my new job. Surely I can wait till I'm 32. That still gives me plenty of time. You just lost that $320,000 double. The point being the most valuable asset you have in retirement planning is time. Use it wisely. And if you're comfortable, go for more aggressive rates of return to get you there sooner. You either retire sooner or richer. Both of those are good things, all right? But I also will tell you that the rule of 72 is amoral. It does not care if it's working for you or against you. So at age 20, you get an envelope in the mail for MasterCard saying, Roy, have I got a deal for you, a $10,000 credit limit, and it's only 18% interest. It'll be fine. And I go to Paris for the weekend, and I have a great lunch, and I max out that credit card. I come back from Paris, and, well, the credit card's maxed out. It's no good anymore, right? I throw it in a desk drawer, I forget about it. For some strange reason, MasterCard forgets about it too. And it's just compounding there at 18% until I'm age 56. And MasterCard comes and taps me on the shoulder and say, Roy, we need to talk. How much do you think I owe MasterCard at that point? How about $5.1 million? Okay, that's the power of the rule of 72 when it's working against you. Point being, when I teach this to my high school students or my MBA students, I'd be, be very cautious about piling up credit card debt. Obviously, MasterCard is not going to wait your 56 to talk about it, but I do want them to understand the power of what's pushing against them. If you pile up credit card debt and you're trying to crawl back out of that hole. All right. But today we're going to focus on the positive side. We're going to focus on getting better rates of return and the option and possibility of doing that through investing in private companies before they've gone public. So, and by the way, that, that uh, picture you're seeing in the upper right-hand corner, that's me. Okay, no, not really. Just kidding. All right, so moving along. Uh, Pre-IPO or OTC. OTC is over-the-counter uh, stocks. Uh, think of it, yeah, step up from penny stocks. Not the best path. That's not usually what we're going for. An IPO means we're headed straight from a public company to a NASDAQ offering, a public offering. So where it gets to be fun is if you get to invest in that company before it has gone public. And we're going to walk through how you do that. I will tell you right now, you can only do this through a self-directed IRA. So if you've got an old 401k or an old IRA laying around somewhere, you need to talk to the nice folks at Intrust and figure out how to get that moved over. So it's a self-directed IRA and you can participate in the kinds of things we're going to be talking about today. All right. Does that make sense? But we're very fussy about the companies we're going to work with. We're going to look at a lot of different companies and we're going to look at specific sectors where we think the best upside is uh, available. Um, but by the time we bring a, a, a public company to, excuse me, a private company to you to think about investing, we've had to check a lot of boxes to make sure it meets our standard. Yes, you may be an engineer that worked in your garage and came up with some great new technology. Does that mean you're going to be a good CEO for a publicly traded company? Do you have a team around you? Do you have patents? Do you have, what are you going to use this capital to do? It better be driving it towards sales and revenue where you'll care about R&D projects. So lots and lots of boxes have to get checked before we're going to say, yep, 
this looks like a good one. We should bring this uh, to our potential investors. All right. So restricted stock, that'll be the next one. What that means is if you've invested in, the, in a private company before it's gone public, the day it goes public, that stock is likely going to be restricted. I can't think of an exception off the top of my head where it was unrestricted. What that means is as long as it's restricted, you can't sell it. So you may have bought this at 50 cents or a dollar in a pre-IPO round and it goes public on Tuesday. The day it goes public is probably going to be restricted for about a year. That protects the other investors, that protects the company. They don't want you dumping the stock the day that it goes public and reaping that harvest and damaging the company and damaging the public and other investors. I think it's a good rule, but you need to be aware of that, that if you invest in pre-IPO or IPO rounds, you're likely going to be restricted for some period of time. You're going to be okay with that. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be fine, all right? But I do want you aware of that, all right? And there's a distinction. If you hear about registered stock, that means you can trade it. If it's restricted, you can't until the restrictions are removed. And there's a process for doing that. And we can walk you through all of that. All right. But you do need to know that, that you're not going to invest uh, pre-IPO and then cash out next Tuesday. That's not the way it's going to work. All right. So next slide. And Roy, just as a quick notice, Alan has joined us in the webinar. Well, we can overcome that. and It'll still be a good. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Alan, welcome. Welcome. I was already explaining to them that I'm funnier and better looking, but that you're smarter. So I'm going to try and pay attention to which slides you're supposed to cover and which slides I'm covering. Uh, but I think we're just about to get to yours. So uh, as a matter of fact, I'll turn this over to Alan. Alan and I have been business partners for over 20 years. Uh, I don't think I actually introduced myself. Maybe I should do that. I am Roy Mullen. I have held as many as five securities licenses, a mortgage license, an insurance license, a driver's license, a marriage license. I just collect licenses. If I see one I don't have, I look at that. Oh, I need one of those. I wonder what it does. Uh, so Alan has also been in financial services for a, for a long time. Uh, he is a very tech savvy guy. Uh, he is my crutch in all those areas. Uh, Alan jokes that he hopes someday he can upgrade me to analog. That would be progress. Uh, but he, he compensates for many of my weaknesses. And with that, I think we'll turn it over to Alan. He's going to walk you through the life cycle of a, a private deal going public and how you would use interest to do that. Alan? Hi, guys. Uh, I don't know if there's background noise, but I'm in an airport and just landed in Dallas. So uh, is this too loud or is this going to be okay? You sound good, Alan. Okay, yeah, there's some music playing in the background. Okay, so life cycle of deal. Um, yeah, there's there's a very specific process that you have to use when you're uh, using a self-directed IRA, and we're gonna walk you through that. This graphic is something that hopefully the uh, company can send out a copy of this. Everybody can have a copy afterwards and take a look at it, but I'll just walk you through it very quickly. The, the first thing that happens is we as a company, Karmic Payback, we're always identifying and sorting through sometimes hundreds of deals, but let's just say on the average about a hundred deals. And we will, we will, we have a, a large, a long set of metrics that we take all these companies through. We get them to the point where we feel they are what we call investable. And when we feel they're at that point, we then start doing the due diligence to uh, and not just the due diligence, but the structure, help design the structure so that people can get involved in whatever way they want to, all right? One of those being using a self-directed IRA. And the reason a self-directed IRA is, import is important is that you cannot invest in private companies uh, through accounts like Charles Schwab, Fidelity, all the, the regular uh, big brokerage houses. Uh, they, they just don't do that. So we need a company like Intrust, and thank goodness there are companies like that, to deploy uh, pre-tax and Roth type monies into these accounts, into these uh, opportunities. So you'll see over on the right-hand side in this uh, in this graphic here, we at the very top, you, you see that we, we, we've gone through the legal, the audits, the all that other stuff, and we, we have the deal ready now uh, at some point so that people can invest in it. There are gonna be people that put their own cash in, there's gonna be sometimes even VC firms and other funds that, that participate in some form. But then the private investors that are utilizing a self-directed IRA will come in through uh, different mechanisms. It might be a convertible note. They might be actually buying private shares uh, themselves. 
we help walk everybody through that. So that's going to be on the right hand side. And as an example, pre IPO round number one, we have sometimes rounds that will be 50 cents a share or it'll be a convertible note that can convert over to 50 cents a share at some point. Uh, and then we may even have a pre IPO round number two. And sometimes that's a little bit higher price dollar a share. Typically what's happening in that scenario is the company in order to raise money to go public is willing to give huge discounts to the people who are participating in that early stage. There's more risk in the company at that stage. So they're going to, uh, you know, they're going to, uh, you know, give everybody a chance that wants to get involved at that, at that level, a huge discount because you're taking more of a risk. But we as a company are de-risking it. And so you want to, if you're ever looking for any kind of pre-IPO opportunities, you want to make sure that whomever has been working with those groups has, first of all, created an exit plan. You don't want to get involved in a private company and just be stuck there forever, right? So that's number one. But even if they have created an exit plan, have they gone through all the processes to make sure that the, the deal is de-risked as much as possible? There's never any way that you can just de-risk something completely. That's why you're getting such a high premium on the potential returns. So let's say you participate in round number one, round number two, and then the, the company goes public. And in this example, we have deals that have gone public at, usually NASDAQ is about five bucks a share. That's the, that's the typical threshold. So if it goes public at five bucks a share, you may on paper, have something you invested in at 50 cents or a dollar, and now it's worth five bucks. That feels pretty good. But as Roy was mentioning, you may be restricted for a while. So let's say we go through that restriction period. It goes public, it's doing well, and at some point the restrictions are lifted and you get your stock. At that point, that's when the, uh, the uh, chassis that you're using through Intrust will no longer be eligible to be used. So what we would end up doing in that scenario is transfer those shares, those publicly traded shares to you and transfer your like, in, you know, sort of in-kind value of your Roth or your IRA over to a Fidelity account or a Charles Schwab account or a whomever else you want to use because a publicly traded stock must be held at those types of brokerage houses. So we help you do that process. You get your stock over there and rinse and repeat because at that point, if it's still doing well, what are you going to want to do? You're going to want to sell it and hopefully reap those rewards. All that cash comes back into your Fidelity, Ameritrade, uh, Charles Schwab type of account. And then guess what you can do? You can now roll that money right back into an interest IRA or Roth, and we start you all over again with another deal. So uh, did that cover it, Roy? Yeah, I think that was great. And obviously, uh, as Munzer pointed out, as questions occur, you have an opportunity there on your screen to enter a question and we'll cover all those at the end as well. And beyond that, we're trying to keep everything today pretty vanilla. There are obviously nuances and subtleties and so forth, and each deal is gonna have its own characteristics. Uh, we'd be happy to take those offline. We're gonna encourage you to reach out to us with an email and say, I'd like to learn more about that, whatever it is. All right, and we'd be happy to get back and take as deep a dive into the weeds as you'd like to take. But yes, I think that covers the life cycle. Any questions on that, pose those to us and we will clarify any remaining questions you have. So the next one, as Alan pointed out, uh, to do what he just described in that life cycle, you've got to use a self-directed IRA, in trust, Fidelity, no, excuse me, uh, Fidelity or Charles Schwab, none of those traditional brokerage houses have this kind of platform. In trust is where you're gonna want to be doing this. And you have a lot of talent on the team there that can help you walk right through that. So take your old 401k, take your old IRAs, roll them over to Intrust, and uh, let's talk about some deals where you're going to get a good rate of return. Most of the deals that we work with do require you to be an accredited investor. Uh, again, we'll kind of give the vanilla version of that. You should be making $200,000 a year as an individual over the last two years, or $300,000 as a couple, or have a net worth excluding your private residence of about a million bucks. Again, if you need clarification on whether or not you qualify under that, we can have that conversation offline or the nice people at Intrust can help you determine if you meet that standard, all right? We do have some deals where you can be not accredited and participate. That's a subset and not as common, but we certainly have those. And uh, we'd be happy to discuss that with you as well. We're gonna list those on our platform through Intrust as accredited only or anybody, so. Uh, we can cover that as the as the deal comes across. So those will be unique to each each deal. All right. Next. Roy, would you like to run that poll now? 
as we discussed. Yes, indeed. I was just about to say, I think we're going to have a poll. So over the next 20 years, do you think federal taxes in general are going to go up or down? So click one of those and we will tally, tally the, the results and see if uh, see if everybody is where I think I am. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Roy. We're just going to give this another 10 seconds here. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for participating. I wanted to ask a sports trivia question, but Andrew wouldn't let me. So. <laughs> Great, I believe that's all we're gonna get. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this up here and share the results. All right, 95% of the people think taxes are going to go up. I am part of the 95%, uh, I agree. Uh, and that being the case, then I, I think that's a nice segue. This would not apply to people who think the taxes are going to go down. So we'll have a separate conversation with those of you that would like to do that. But if you think taxes are gonna go up and you currently have a traditional IRA, now let's go back to that cycle for a moment. Let's think about the, that cycle. So we're going to buy pre-IPO. Well, you don't, I'm sorry, you don't literally have to go back. My apologies. My um, mistake there, Roy. Uh, my apologies. But let's assume we bought that pre-IPO stock at 50 cents a round or a dollar a round and it went public at five. What if you did that inside a Roth IRA and that 50 cents is now worth $5? How about never paying taxes on any of that growth? And when you're 59 and a half and you start taking that out, you pay no taxes on it. Historically, our tax rates are about as low as they've ever been. I know it doesn't feel like that on April 15th, but if you look at the data, it's actually very low historical tax rates. I would want you to think about converting your traditional IRA now, take the tax hit now, get that income added to this year's taxable income, take your, take your lumps now, move it over to a Roth IRA with interest, invest in one of these companies and see if we can get that 50 cent stock to go to $5 and never pay taxes on the gain or the withdrawal. Who's your buddy? You can talk to those nice people at interest and they can walk you through exactly how to do that. Um, so that's for people who think taxes in general are going to go up. Take your hit now and take your harvest tax-free later. All right. So, oh, and by the way, this is just a, a, a footnote for you. There'll be some people on the call to go, oh, they tell me I make way too much money. I can't have a Roth IRA. Well, can you really? So what about a SEP IRA? Let's assume you're self-employed and talk to your accountant and they will tell you, your CPA will tell you how much you'd be allowed to contribute to a SEP IRA. But let's assume for this exercise that you can make a maximum contribution. So in 2023, that's $66,000 you could put in a SEP IRA. Think of it as a traditional IRA, it's just a bigger bucket for the self-employed, right? So you put $66,000 in there on Tuesday for 2023, and on Wednesday, you convert it to a Roth and you take a tax hit of $66,000. That's a zero sum game. You got a deduction on Tuesday, you're gonna pay the taxes on Wednesday, right? Put, the, put it back on your income on Wednesday. But now it's a Roth IRA. And now you go invest in some of that 50 cent stock and hope it goes to $5 and paying no gains on any of that ever. All right. Again, send us an email if you want to take a deeper dive on that conversation, be happy to do that. But I just showed you an example of you, you make too much money. You can't have a Roth. Well, you just did. You invested in a traditional IRA or a SEPA IRA and then converted it. You now have a Roth. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Now the next one. So what kinds of private companies do we look at? What are, what are we wanting to do there? All right. And Alan, I believe that we're passing this back over to you at this point. Uh, so he's going to talk about the six second. Alan, you still there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cut out for a second. Right. Yeah. My, uh, my wife is an author, so she, she hates when I do this, but the, 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 Silly alliterations, right? So six sexy sectors. There's more, but you know these are the these are the heavy duty ones that we really uh, tend to focus on. Uh, there are exceptions to these. Uh, we've, we've we've got some one offs that have been incredibly successful that do not fit in one of these. But right now, if you take a look at the entire market, and I was just looking at a few of our deals a few minutes ago that are just going through the roof today. It's pretty fun to watch what's going on, and they tend to fall in these sectors. So technology and SaaS, what is SaaS? That is software as a service. 
we actually have a new category that we're starting to dip into, which is pretty interesting, and it's called Robots as a Service, R-A-A-S. We got a lot of companies that are creating uh, a whole fleet of robots that they will rent out to companies to maximize their, their, uh, their supply chain uh, management, their uh, manufacturing, or whatever it is. And these robots, instead of the companies having to go out to go buy them, they rent them as a service. And it's an incredible business model. So we've got that as well. So technology and SaaS, that's a big one. Infrastructure, this is roads, bridges, uh, just telecom, all that kind of stuff. There's, there's tons, of, tons of opportunities in that sector as well. Space and aviation, we've got a few uh, really successful examples that we can point to that have happened just in the last couple of years. And that industry is exploding as almost everyone on the call probably already knows. You've got you know, SpaceX and Blue Origin and just tons of other big companies that then outsource a lot of stuff to very small startup type space companies. And there are lots and lots and lots of those. Medical, health, uh, healthcare. We've got a healthcare company about to go public in April. It is an incredible opportunity. That would be one of the ones that we would want to discuss with you if you're interested uh, in trying to uh, in trying to get involved in some of these things. Because the cool thing about that one is it's only going to have a 90 day lockup period after the IPO, and you can be completely liquid. That's very that's unheard of in a pre IPO setting where you can get involved before it's public, uh, and then 90 days after it goes public, be fully liquid. Pretty cool. And uh, healthcare is a growing industry, but there's there's niches within healthcare, especially mental healthcare, that we're very interested in, and that's what this company is in. It's a mental healthcare uh, services company that is just run like a weed. Uh, cybersecurity, big one. And there's also, again, that's a, that's a very uh, crowded environment. There's lots and lots and lots of cybersecurity firms. So what we tend to try to do in this scenario is we try to bunch a bunch of those guys together and roll them all together into one bundle and they're, you know, two plus two plus two is not always six. It might end up being 16 because of the power that they can get from being bundled together into one group. And then, of course, green technology, green energy, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of money flowing in that direction, not just public, private money as well. So those are the six sexy sectors that we like to focus on. There are one offs that are different, but uh, these tend to these tend to do very well. That's it for me. All right. Well, Alan, I think this next slide is also supposed to be yours. Do you want to keep going? Sure. Okay. Okay, great. So one of the things that's interesting, guys, is that what we've been able to create, and we always try to try to remain as, 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 uh, as uh, uh, you know, non-biased as possible, but we are kind of biased <laughs> towards what we do, of course. There's lots of opportunities out there if you go and research on the Internet to get involved in pre-IPO companies. Uh, the, the challenges with those, as I mentioned earlier, is that a, a lot of those, you just get stuck. You get involved and it's like, oh, this is a great company. It's private. I can get involved, buy a stock at X price. There's no exit strategy and you're just kind of stuck there. What we've got instead is a priority group that we have been able to create and we call this our VIP IPO or you know something like that group where if you get involved in a, in a deal, let's say even just a small amount, even the minimum, nothing big, and you have some success on that, you become liquid on some later date, then we have a priority group that we always reserve that the people that have already been in a deal can get in another deal first. And the people that get in, the, in these types of opportunities, what's cool about that is a lot of times when we're working with an investment bank, we can have those people set up that even if you didn't get involved in the pre-IPO, because you weren't liquid at the time for the pre-IPO involvement, the day of the IPO is also a good buy. And I don't know how many of you guys were aware of some of these IPOs that have happened in the last 10 years or so, but some of these technology companies went out at, you know, let's say 40 bucks or 10 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever it was. The general public usually doesn't get to buy at that price. And it's kind of sad to watch because you'll see XYZ company goes out at 40 bucks, but nobody got to really buy that. And you know something happened behind the scenes where people got to buy it at that price. It's not pre-IPO, it's the day of the IPO, the strike price. How do they do that? Well, you have to be involved in a deal where you got, an, you got a, an investment bank or somebody who will let you reserve those accounts in advance. So you open up a brokerage account with them, just like a Fidelity Schwab, et cetera. You can open up an account with them. We can do that through your interest account because it's not, it hasn't IPO'd yet. So we open it up through your interest account. The day that it goes IPO, you get the price. 
you get the actual price that it comes out that day. And if it's a, if it's a company that's going to be successful and it goes up from there, and then you can get liquid and sell it, you do that from within that brokerage account. That still technically is a private transaction. And then we move it over to your Fidelity or Schwab or other transaction, uh, other uh, uh, type of brokerage account as well. That's an exciting opportunity. We always have those coming along where we can say, hey, you didn't get on the pre-IPO, but we have a VIP IPO position for you. You get to buy the strike price the day of. That's pretty cool as well. So look for those opportunities out there. We've got them as well. All right. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so we're going to spend a little time now talking about case studies, and I'm going to have a uh, entertaining interlude here for you uh, just to challenge your paradigm. So how many of you are familiar, I'm sure everybody on the call is familiar with uh, Lucy and Charlie Brown and Linus and the Peanuts gang, right? One of my favorite stories uh, that illustrates shifting of a paradigm is uh, Lucy walking is walking down the sidewalk and she looks down and she goes, oh my gosh, that's the rare Brazilian left-handed butterfly. Oh my gosh, those fly thousands of miles every year from Brazil to here and migrate and then they fly back to Brazil and science is baffled and how in the world do they figure this out and get to Brazil and back? And about that time, Linus walks up and he, he looks down at the sidewalk and he looks back up at Lucy and he looks back down at the sidewalk and he looks up at Lucy and he said, Lucy, Lucy, why, why are you staring at a potato chip? And Lucy looks a little closer and she goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you're right, that is a potato chip. And she thinks for a moment, goes, huh, I wonder how a potato chip got all the way from Brazil. So have you ever found yourself in that situation where you get so locked into an assumption, to a paradigm that you think you understand how things work and never see a possibility or other possibilities? That's sort of what we're talking about today. I know before I got more heavily involved in this uh, in the last few years, I always assumed the people that got involved in companies before they went public had to play golf with the right billionaire at the right country club to find out about those things. And we're here today to challenge that assumption for you. You can also participate in a company that has uh, disruptive technology in one of the six sexy sectors. You can be involved in that process in watching it go to a NASDAQ listing and going public. You know, when it rings the bell, you're there ringing the bell as well because you're part of that process. Again, this is your risk capital, no guarantees, all that kind of good stuff. But we work very hard to de-risk the projects that we bring to you. It has to check a lot of boxes before we're going to bring it to you. So we're going to get, give you some case studies. There's, uh, Alan's touched on one of those about uh, medical health uh, staffing technology around mental health. And the company has a great track record. The entrepreneur that has done this has uh, built six other companies, never gone the public route before, but he has been fascinated by what we're doing. But he flat knows how to build a company. He's a great CEO and just lands contract after contract after contract. Two years ago, his revenue was a million, little over a million dollars. This last year, it was a bit over seven million. He's on track for over 30 million this year. That is uh, directionally correct, as we say in the trade. Uh, and that's gonna go public in May. And there's an opportunity to participate uh, with a discounted IPO stock, not to be confused with the pre-IPO. We can talk about that later, but if you would like to buy it today for less than it's gonna go public for, we should have that conversation. Uh, as we talked about, there's a robot project we're working on. Imagine uh, Transformers, gigantic robots. So you bring in a 777, they're required by law. All airplanes are required by law. Every seven years, you have to strip the paint off and give it a new paint job. If you don't, you can't. that plane can't leave the ground. A 777 depreciates at $50,000 a day, whether it's flying or not. Traditional methods for that are you bring it in and humans in suits and and uh, scrapers go out and scrape the paint off that plane and get out the paint sprayers and spray it again. They're breathing paint chips. It takes about two weeks that it's parked in the hangar for going undergoing this process. Think about giant robots. And we can send you a demo video of this thing. Think of giant robots that take lasers and strip all the paint off of it, catch every particle so humans aren't breathing the paint particles and they can use lasers to put a thinner coat of paint back on it again. It's gonna save several thousand pounds of paint. Now you can either have greater fuel efficiency at that point, or you can put two more seats on the plane because you just saved the weight that has been paint. 
And by the way, they're going to do that in five days instead of two weeks. Which do you like better? <laughs> All right. How would you like to do that one pre-IPO? Uh, one other one, uh, infrastructure. There's a new technology for building the road, road bases stronger, solving problems that traditional road bases with lime and Portland cement and so forth can't solve. Uh, and they've been building roads the old way for 100 years. There hasn't been a, a new technology in that area forever. With this technology, we're going to take existing base material, grind it up, add this powder, add water, and it's uh, and then they compress it. So there's an example in Laredo. You all may not know this, but Laredo in, uh, in Texas is the second largest port in the country, second only to Los Angeles. And it has no ships. It has no Gulf access. It is roads. It is everything going north and south from the U.S. to any point south or any point south coming north to the U.S., all in heavy trucks. Therefore, their roads are in rough shape. And we are doing a, just completed a, are doing a test road there. Uh, they were going to take one mile of road, rip out the failed road that had failed because of heavy truck traffic, rip it out, haul it to a landfill. You can think how long that would take. Bring in all new base materials, which are the same base materials that just failed, and build a new road and cross your fingers and hope this one works better. Or you can use this new technology. Don't haul away anything. Grind up the existing road, add the powder, add the water, compress it. We have Los Alamos National Lab studies behind it. We have Atlas Lab studies behind it. It's on the verge of a TxDOT approval, Texas Department of Transportation approval. And in that case, one mile of road, saving them $400,000. Now, do any of you drive down a road that's not working well? Would you like to solve that problem? How many miles of road in the U.S. need to be rebuilt? How would you like to invest in a technology that's going to solve that problem? All right. Um, well, that's, I think, all the time we probably have. I hope we didn't bore you too much. Hope you learned some good stuff. We would love for you to send an email to me. Most days I can remember my own name, so that's my email address. Uh, send us an email and just put in the subject line, would like to learn more about Karmic Payback. And we will get you signed up for our newsletter and start introducing you to some of the deals that we've been working on and answer any questions you have. And with that, I guess it's time for the Q&A. Roy, Alan, thank you so much uh, for this uh, this uh, informative uh, uh, presentation. So uh, what's next? Um, so we would like to um, have you join us for our next upcoming webinar next month. Uh, it's uh, talking about 10 reasons to get familiar with uh, foreign investments. Register today and join us on March 15th. If you have any feedback or topic requests, please let us know in the survey as you leave. If you want more information about self-directed IRAs, visit our website, dntrustgroup.com and the Learning Center, or call our regional offices. We're happy to assist you. Obviously, follow us on the social media for any updates as well. So time for questions, as uh, Roy mentioned right now. So we'll look at the questions here, if they're pertaining to, pertain to uh, self-directed IRAs or uh, the Entrust Group, I'm happy to address those. If they pertain to subject matter today, Roy and Alan will be happy to address this. In the meantime, uh, to stay connected, please, uh, here's our contact information, mine as well as Roy and Alan's. Um, if Roy and Alan want to add their phone numbers as well, please, uh, please feel free to, to, to uh, do so. Um, so let's go to our questions here and see what we have, please. Great. Thank you, Munzer. So question number one. So in regards to an IRA and pre-IPO investing, the question is, wouldn't that make it difficult to meet required minimum distribution if the account does not have a tradable asset? Good. Okay. Actually, that's a great question. We get that quite often. So for ones that are not familiar with RMDs, required minimum distributions, the IRS says if you have a pre-tax, which is a traditional IRA, does not obviously apply to a Roth IRA because you pay the taxes ahead of time. But if you have a traditional IRA, you are required to take minimum distributions at a, after a certain age. Right now, it's 72 and a half. So this is based on the total amount of your retirement plan, not just your interest IRA account. So when calculating this RMD, you're basing it on every single dollar you have in your retirement account. Um, so obviously the assumption here, and the good assumption is that you have just allocated a portion of your retirement plan to invest in these alternative investments. 
So when it's come to when it's time to satisfy this requirement on distribution, you can take it out from some more liquid investments uh, or accounts that you have elsewhere. I, I agree. This this is Roy. I would say let, let, we use simple math again. Let's assume you have a hundred thousand dollars in the only IRA that you have, and your RMD is estimated to be ten thousand dollars. Pick a number then you would only invest 90,000 in one of these uh, types of projects so that you've kept the 10,000 back liquid to meet your minimum, uh, your, your R&D requirement. Does that make sense? Yes. Great, thank you. Question number two. Do I need to let Entrust know when the convertible note converts to shares but is not yet public? So the answer is yes. So when we book the asset, it's all about just just uh, you know what we're booking, what we're booking the asset as is. So when we purchase this as a convertible note, it's booked as a note in your uh, interest account. When uh, you're converting that to shares, just a matter of providing us with a subscription agreement, um, so we could turn around and book this asset properly in your interest account. Yes. And, and this is Roy again, and we will help you on the, the paperwork side with the company you invested in, getting the right documentation that Munzer would need to uh, keep your account current on the interest side. And we help facilitate that. Great. Thank you both. Next question. So what are the taxes on the pre-IPO slash OTC lifecycle? If it is done through your IRA, there are no tax consequences. The only time there will be a tax consequence is when you take it out and put it in your pocket. So as long as you're moving, we'll use this example of you have a traditional IRA with Charles Schwab. And so we start off with interest. We invest in the private company. The private company goes public. We take the public stock, move it over to your Schwab account. When the restrictions are removed, you decide, I want to take the money off the table. You liquidate all that. It's now cash. You take the cash. You move it back to your interest group and say, Roy and Alan, what's next? That was fun. In that entire cycle, there were no tax consequences. You just move it from one IRA to another IRA, back to the original IRA, no tax consequences. If you cash it in and put the money in your pocket, you just triggered a taxable event. And if you're under 59 and a half, you trigger a taxable event and the penalty. So don't do that. Does that help? Yes, thank you so much. Next question. On average, how long from when a deal becomes available until IPO occurs? Very good question. Uh, typically, we're going to, uh, we've identified a company, they're going to go pre-IPO, we're doing a 50 cent round to raise the cash for them to be able to get their audits done. Uh, and speaking of which, to give you comfort as an investor, the audits that are done on a company on track to go NASDAQ are not your local CPA that does your local tax returns. This is a higher standard for a publicly traded company. They're also going to be doing a uh, filings with the SEC in which you get naked before the doctor. There are no secrets left when by the time the SEC is done with you and before you're going to NASDAQ. Again, to give you comfort as an investor that everything is as presented. Uh, so we're going to probably do a 50 cent round at, at let's say that, that takes nine months to get the audits done get the s1 filings done all that kind of good stuff all the legal stuff then it goes public when it goes public you're now restricted probably for a year so from your initial investment you're probably looking 18 to 20 months before you can take your money on off the table that is worst case outside there are other things that could trigger the release of those restrictions sooner that's getting into the weeds uh, so we can talk about that offline if you like. But for a rule of thumb, from the day you made your investment, the outer limit is probably something on the range of 20 months by the time it's completely unrestricted. Hey, Roy, this is Alan. Uh, as an exception to that, though, as I mentioned earlier, we do have situations come across where you might not have quite that big of a gap where you're buying at 50 cents and then it's going to be planned to go to NASDAQ at five bucks, six bucks, something like that. Like the one that we just mentioned earlier, Syra is, is the name of the company. Uh, we have a situation where we've already done pre-IPO rounds with them. Those are done. Now we're so close to the IPO that they just need a little bit more capital to get them to the finish line. And that last batch of capital is still technically pre-IPO. 
but it is being sold at a discount to the IPO and only has a 90 day restriction after the IPO. So there are, there's those situations come along sometimes where it's six months or less is the restricted period where you can not necessarily cash in and put it in your pocket. As we already mentioned, you don't want that, but you then get that money uh, liquid inside the IRA world or Roth IRA world that you're in over to your Schwab account so that it is publicly traded stock. Now you can li liquidate it. It's just still sitting there as cash inside your Roth or inside your IRA. You haven't put it in your pocket, so you've not created any taxable events. But we have deals that are less than six months as well. Great, thank you. And somebody just cheekily remarked, well, not if one invested in SpaceX. Exit date is unknown on that one still. So. And, and, and we wouldn't have done that one. That's, <laughs> they did not have a clear path to an exit, not one that would have checked all of our boxes. Great, thank you. Next question. Can an exit be made through a private middle market transaction rather than a de facto IPO? Not on deals that we work with. I'm sure there are exceptions to mid market transactions. That's not an area that we have expertise in or would be working with a company where that was the obvious uh, path. So yeah, technically, yes, they're, they're, they, to answer your question, technically, yes, that can be done. It is not typical with companies that we're going to be working with. That's not the exit we'd be working towards. Yeah, the, the exception to that could be that, let's say that we've helped a company. This can happen. We have a company that we've helped get prepared for an IPO. They're headed that direction, and then they get bought. That can happen. And they just decide not to go public because the deal is too rich. Well, then everybody gets taken out in that scenario. All the investors then are taken out. You're made whole on your investment plus whatever premium you were supposed to get in that transaction. That all goes back into your Roth or your IRA, no taxable event, but it just never did get to the public event. That's the reason that could happen. Great, thank you. Next question. With that section of the six sectors, I know y'all mentioned there are others, but this person posed, uh, why isn't AI listed amongst the top six? Well, I think we probably would have lumped that under a technology, but you're, you're right. That would That is certainly something that interests us. It's certainly not a mature market, therefore there are opportunities. Uh, we do have subject matter experts we consult with uh, on whether or not the technology is indeed disruptive and the market is there and the path to the market is there. So yes, AI is something we would consider. We, we actually have some AI companies coming into the fold that we're looking at. Cool, thank you for that update. Next question. What percentage of pre-IPO deals historically have not worked out? Are you asking about deals we've worked with or the market in general? The market in general, the batting average is not terrific. Uh, and that's of course across all sectors, which is one of the reasons we limit the sectors where we think there's an appetite and an energy and an enthusiasm, uh, even if it's uh, an excessive enthusiasm uh, like SpaceX. Uh, so broadly speaking, the batting average is not great. The batting average within the sectors that we do is better. And the batting average for karmic uh, as a subset of that within those sectors is very high. I, we have not had a single project we have done in the last two years in which our investors were not very happy. We'll put it that way. Thank that, you. And Barry, if you want to reach out for more specific information, either let us know in the survey or um, some other way and we can get you connected with Roy and Alan offline. Thank you. All right, next question. So how would an SDIRA work with a brand new startup? What is needed to allow investors who would like to participate in the startup via an SDIRA? So I know you broke this down a bit, but just kind of in short, how would they get started? So, so, I'm sorry, sorry. go ahead. Sorry, mm -hmm. Anna, let, let me just kind of outline the, the process here in terms of, and then obviously you can add on. So it's really simple, three steps, open a self-directed IRA, funded through a transfer from another uh, traditional uh, brokerage firm, uh, as, as Alan and uh, Roy mentioned, and then turn, we turn around and fund the investment for you. In terms of paperwork for us needed, 
to to fund the investment it's just the uh, the subscription agreement showing the ira as the subscriber um and then we turn around and fund it it's very simple um so roy if you want anything else to add feel free please yeah no i think you did a, a great job on that and again on the private company side of the equation uh, obviously munzer has got it well in hand on the interest side of it in terms of the paperwork coming from the private company most commonly it's a convertible note so you're going to put a hundred thousand dollars in and the note's going to say it's going to mature in a year at the end of the year they're going to give you a 12 percent risk premium call it interest uh, and you're going to if if somewhere along the way you didn't choose to convert and say you know on second thought, I want my my hundred thousand converted into stock in the company because I like where this is headed. You wouldn't invest in one of these deals just planning to get a rate. That's not that wouldn't be the point, right? So you're gonna probably you're gonna want to convert, but the note convertible note gives you the option. If you decide uh, you don't think the CEO is up to the task, or for whatever reason you decide, I just want my money back. They're gonna give you your money back in an interest, right? Most likely you're going to convert, and when that conversion happens and you now have stock, you let Munzer know about that. And then when the stock goes public, we uh, we let Munzer know that. Uh, but typically it's a convertible note. There are some situations in which you're going to just buy stock directly through a private placement through of, of the company's stock, but the convertible note is the most common instrument. We can help you on the private company side of it and walk you through the instruments being used uh, in that specific example. Hope that helps. Thank you very much. Next question. Will these opportunities be listed on the Intrust website? Oh, so, who has a fat pitch down the middle? Thank you. Oh. Yeah, let me let me address that real quick. So they're not listed on the Intrust website per se. They're listed on our um, exclusive Intrust um, Connect marketplace, which is located within the Entrust client portal um, where our investors conduct their transactions. So we, we allow the opportunity for investment sponsors to list those inside our marketplace, again, with very um, just generic information about uh, the type of investment, so on and so forth, minimum investments. And then if they have any questions, they meaning our clients, they can reach out to the investment sponsor, in this case, uh, Tarmic, uh, uh, for more information, but uh, they're not, if you go to our website per se, they're not listed there, no. The other way, obviously, you can stay in touch is to send an email either to Alan or to me, and we'll sign you up for our newsletter. So as we're uh, listing deals, you will get notice of that, and you can reach back out to us and say, hey, what's this one you're doing about painting robots or something? Tell me more. I do want to also clarify, by the way, that you will never, ever, you will never, ever be making a check payable to Karmic Payback. We do not have a fund. We're going to identify, we think, are worthy private companies on track for a NASDAQ offering. And when you choose to invest, you'll be investing with that company, not with us. Okay. I, we did, I did a seminar with Alan. I did a seminar in Austin not too long ago. And there was an SEC lawyer in the audience who was completely baffled by the time we got to the end of it. He'd been an SEC lawyer for about 35 years. He had clients that uh, were both the private company seeking capital and a group of investors that uh, were looking for investment opportunities. And he said, well, wait a minute, you, you mean we're not investing in Karmic? I said, no. He said, well, I have clients that are investing in a fund that invests in a fund that invests in a fund and then that fund invest in a company. And I went, Oh my, oh no, no, that's not what we do. And that's not what you should do, but I didn't say that. Anyway, sorry, back to your next question. No, you're good, Roy, thank you. So this next one, it starts to uh, venture on advice. So Munzer, I'll have you take this, but should I buy precious metals instead of stock? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know if you wanna give maybe some opinion without uh, advice, but just I know we have to skirt around okay. this a bit differently. So obviously, well, thanks for the question, Andrew. And, and, and actually, it's, it's a good question. I mean, the interest group, obviously, we're just the administrator. We don't sell or promote any products or give any sort of advice, including investment, tax, legal, or financial. So if the question is, should I buy precious metals instead of stock? Obviously, that's totally up to you. The question is, can I buy precious metals? Absolutely. That's where the self-directed IRA 
you can pretty much invest in anything with the exception of a couple of non-permissible investments assets such as uh, collectibles and, and S corporations and, and, and life insurance products and so on. So whether you want to invest in precious metals or stocks or, or both for that matter, a self-directed IRA would allow you the opportunity to do so. We always say invest in what you know or understand. So if you are uh, investing in or, or buying, purchasing precious metals outside of your IRA, now there's a good opportunity for you to set up a SD IRA and do that, you know, inside it. Same thing with stocks, same thing with real estate. Hope that helps. Thank you, Munzer. Next question. How are fees determined for these transactions? So our interest fees, I'm happy to discuss. Obviously, if you can go to our website, they're there, or, or email me um, directly. I don't want to spend so much time on them, but it's just as, as low sometimes as uh, $199 a year for the annual record-keeping fee. There's a very nominal um, startup uh, setup and establishment fee of $50 and a purchase fee of $95. But again, for a more complete um, description of our fees, uh, please uh, shoot me an email or, or uh, call my office. I'm happy to discuss that with you. And, and to clarify, you don't pay us anything. The company that we help raise capital for uh, pays us through a consulting arrangement. So it comes out of their hide, not yours. Absolutely. Thank you for confirming. Next question. Do you provide exits for assets that have not been IPO'd after several years, i.e. on a secondary market that can be had by SpaceX? So kind of alluding to that previous example, like are there backdoor kind of policies for that such situation? Roy, can I take that one? Absolutely. Okay. You know, this is an interesting question, guys. We've been, uh, we've been exploring this area for years now. There is absolutely an appetite and a need for a secondary market for private companies. The difficulty lies, of course, in the regulations and details. So there are things being developed right now that we cannot talk about publicly yet that sound and smell exactly like what you're describing, but we cannot promise that we can get people into those scenarios, but there are people who have gone through all the regulatory trouble to get themselves set up to, to create a secondary market for private transactions. It's coming. And it will happen at some point. There's just too much appetite and too much necessity in the market to have that option be available for people to buy from other people that invested early and want to get out, but they don't have an exit yet. So it's coming. Thank you very much. Next question. So uh, correct me if you just uh, touched on this, but does karmic payback get paid by the investor seeking investable opportunities or by the company that is seeking capital? By the company seeking capital. It's a consulting arrangement with them. Uh, our investors will never write a check to us, period. All right, cut and dry. Thank you very much. <laughs> a couple more. Where is karmic located? Austin, Texas. And if you come to Austin, we'll show you some great barbecue. Thank you, Brian. Uh, another classic question. What is the typical minimum investment? And if it varies, could you please explain? Good question. Alan, you want to take that one or you want me to? Uh, yeah, I'll take the first stab at it. Uh, the, the average is somewhere around 25,000. We have exceptions where, I mean, we just had one recently very interesting uh, technology that is a translation technology. And because of the structure and the way everything was all set up, they not only allowed non-accredited investors, but it was as low as 4,000 bucks. So, I mean, we have stuff that's very low. We have other ones that are 100,000 minimum, sometimes 250,000 minimum, but typically they're in that 25,000 range. That's, that's kind of what we try to negotiate with these companies. We don't want the minimum to be so high because typically what works out is let's say they're raising two and a half million dollars. All right. If they're raising two and a half million pre IPO, they're not going to. Okay. I think we may have lost Alan, but hopefully that answers your question. Oh, take some at the 25,000. We even have scenarios where we can sweet talk somebody because it's just a you know friends and family kind of scenario. We really want to help somebody out, get them involved. 
get it all the way down to you know 10,000 or so, even on a deal that is raising two and a half million. So it's kind of case by case. Does that answer it, Roy? Yeah, I think 25 is probably the minimum normal. So yes, there are exceptions. You're welcome. And I'm sure both of you would echo, just always stay in touch with uh, these gentlemen and other people that have such opportunities. Cause like they mentioned, there's new things coming down the pipe that might challenge current status quo. So yeah, just stay in touch. All right, one more question here, gentlemen. It is, is there a way to loan your Roth IRA additional funds or other ways to increase your available investable funds apart from rollover slash 6K annual backdoor? So appreciate the tip up front. Just any other thoughts on different strategies for that? So from an IRA point of view, the short answer is no. I mean, there are limits on, on what, you, uh, what you can contribute. In 2023, the good news is uh, the contribution limits have uh, uh, risen from uh, 6,500 um, or 7,500 for those 50 and old, older. So if you want to open an account and then use the backdoor IRA method that we were talking about to convert, that's your maximum what you can do for the tax year. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. I would touch on again, if you qualify for a SEP IRA, a self-employment pension, uh, if you qualify for that, talk to your CPA, you could put as much as $66,000 in 2023 into a SEP IRA and then convert it to a Roth. Uh, it'd be up to you and your CPA to figure out how much you'd be allowed to contribute to that, but the maximum is 66,000 this year. So that could fatten up your Roth IRA fairly quickly. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, if anybody has any final questions, please get them in now in this last 15, 20 seconds, we'll hold tight. Um, but otherwise, that brings us to the end of our questions. And I wanna thank you both or all three of you so much today for your time. As we get wrapped up here, uh, Munzer, I'll let you take it away. I don't think we have any more. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and yes, thank you, Roy and Alan, for joining us uh, this morning. It's been fascinating, great information. I want to thank all of you out there listening um, to us, and I hope to uh, see you guys uh, next month, uh, March 15th, for our next uh, webinar. Thank you so much, and have a great day. And our thank you to Antrust for hosting this. We had a great time. Hope you all learned some stuff. Thank you, thank you. guys. This was wonderful. Love thank you, everyone. Have bye a bye. wonderful day. Bye-bye. You too.